there are some policy choices that can impact all of us. So today we're taking a closer look at Joe Biden's tax plans. Garrett, Wils Garrett Watson, senior policy analyst at the Tax Foundation, has dug into the plan and joins us now. Garrett, good to uh, good to speak with you today. Uh, you know, one of the themes coming off the the start of the convention yesterday, Joe Biden uh, may push off tax increases, and perhaps he's a more moderate or he would be a more moderate. Uh, president, but you have crunched the numbers and what your numbers suggest, uh, he would be negative for, for GDP growth. Walk us through this. That's right. Joe Biden's tax plan primarily aims at raising taxes on higher earners, uh, raising taxes on corporations, and raising taxes on business and investment income for those higher earners. Overall, it raised about three and a half trillion dollars over 10 years, but we find that it does have an impact on economic growth. It would re reduce growth by about one and a half percent over the course of uh, the long run and would reduce jobs by about 800,000 uh, overall. And so there really is a trade-off when it comes to these tax hikes uh, in the form of reduced growth. And that's especially important right now as we're trying to rebuild the economy and get out of this economic crisis. You know, if we don't raise taxes, I mean, aren't we heading for a cliff once the, the stimulus bills all start to come due and the fact that we're, you know, printing money and our deficit continues to balloon? That's right. Debts and deficits are going to be increasingly important to tackle coming out of this crisis. It's really important right now to be prioritizing targeted relief to the most vulnerable, given how high the unemployment rate is right now and the public health crisis that we're facing. But as that crisis recedes and growth uh, resumes, we will need to tackle these rising debts and deficits that will require tough decisions on the spending side of things, but will also pro probably will require a conversation about revenue. And we need to find ways to raise revenue through the tax system that also minimizes the economic harms. And that's going to be the tough trade-off that the, any next administration and next term will have to deal with, uh, both to balance long-run growth while also raising the revenue we need to reduce these debts and deficits. Okay, what did you find uh, in Kamala Harris's uh, tax plan? Harris's tax plan shares a lot of similarities with Joe Biden's in that it really does target uh, repealing elements of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the tax reform a few years ago, uh, and does try to raise revenue from higher earners. Though she is more aggressive in doing so by pushing for higher tax rates uh, and would raise a bit more revenue. The other thing is she's developed a very uh, fleshed out plan for tax credits and providing relief for uh, lower earners. And that's something we haven't seen as much from uh, Biden yet. So looking forward to seeing how uh, the campaign decides to take that plan and whether or not that becomes a centerpiece of his tax plan moving forward. You know, for all the, for all his promises, uh, Trump says, you know, he's not going to raise taxes. Um, will he have no choice but to do that if he's elected again during his next four year term, simply because the numbers aren't going to match up and, and, and cities and states are going to need and the federal government is going to need revenue source. We are going to have to have a, a, have a discussion about what forms of revenue need to come in to close debts and deficits and to rectify our, our budget situation. And that requires prioritizing places that are that we can raise taxes that minimize uh, the effects on growth. Places like tax expenditures, broadening the tax base, uh, looking at items like the state and local tax deduction or even the home mortgage interest deduction are probably the first places to look at. Those are expenditures that typically benefit the well-off. Uh, and would uh, make the code simpler and more neutral if we were to uh, reform them and minimize them. Uh, and of course, we also have to prioritize uh, pro-growth elements, which also will help on the budget side of things. A big one, of course, is allowing businesses to fully deduct the cost of their investments when they make them, uh, something that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made progress on, but something that we're optimistic that we can get bipartisan support on in combination with other uh, tax reforms that will help with the budget situation. Hey, Garrett, Rick Newman here. Uh, Biden also wants to essentially raise the capital gains tax, make it uh, equal to the highest uh, tax on income for, uh, I think it's people earning uh, over $400,000. Would that affect uh, stock values, do you think? We do think that it would have a, an effect on the economy, on the financial markets potentially, uh, and on economic growth overall, though it, it's worth not overstating those effects. Uh, generally, uh, the, the economy being more international than it has been uh, over the last a few decades, uh, that savings overall is not a problem for additional investment and to generate profits in the United States. And so while there is a growth effect uh, from uh, changing the rates overall, either higher or lower, the president, for example, would like to see them cut to 15%. The priority really should be on areas where there's going to be the greatest uh, damage to the economy. And typically we see that uh, through direct taxes on firms and businesses and through uh, cost recovery items like being able to deduct 
uh, the full cost of your investments uh, in the tax code. And so while capital gains is important and something we need to talk about and, and a tax treatment of savings overall can really be improved in this country, uh, that's not a place where we think is going to be a particular harm or benefit moving forward, given the evidence that we have. Biden also, he now favors um, that al alternative corporate tax that Elizabeth Warren um, rolled out um, when she was running in the primaries. So the idea there is for companies that don't pay a lot of tax uh, because they use different write-offs, but they do have uh, a lot of income they report to shareholders to make them pay some minimum tax. Uh, but those write-offs are, are part of the legal tax code uh, and they're there uh, as incentives to invest and do other things. Does that make any sense that corporate alternative, uh, that alternative corporate tax, and if you uh, try to enact that through legislation, would you then have to change the incentives that it's, it's actually trying to uh, counteract? You're right. The minimum tax proposal is meant to try to go after corporations that may post book income but don't have taxable profits. And one of the biggest differences between those two types of income is uh, write-offs for new investments, uh, which is something that we want to be incentivizing right now, not uh, penalizing. Uh, overall, minimum taxes are a very blunt instrument for raising revenue and reforming the corporate code. It would make things much more complicated, and to some extent, would actually put some of some of these tax decisions in uh, in the laps of accountants in the financial community. Something that's also concerning. So overall, it would be better for policymakers to think about ways to tweak the tax code directly uh, in terms of taxing corporations. Uh, rather than going the route of minimum taxes, which is going to increase complexity and disincentivize the very kind of investment we need right now that's going to get us out of this economic crisis in the years ahead.